So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Leah uh, and I'm the Director of Knowledge Exchange at Women's Shelters Canada. I'm really excited about our workshop today on vicarious resilience. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting um, presentation. We'll have a chance to discuss together, to go into breakout rooms. So it'll be a little bit more interactive than some sessions we've done in the past for those of you who've been here before. Um, so it's going to be, I think, a really good um, workshop. So before I go further, I do want to start by acknowledging that I'm joining you today from the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. Um, and I want to acknowledge my responsibility as a settler on these lands um, to continue to learn about the historical and the ongoing impacts of settler colonialism um, and to support the work of, of reconciliation and decolonization. Now, I know there are folks joining us from all across Turtle Island all across the country. Um, if you wanna just say hi in the chat, let us know where you're joining from, what organization you're with, just say hi. It would be really fun to have a sense of who's in the room with us today. Now, a few last housekeeping reminders. Um, as I've mentioned before, I am going to ask folks to stay on mute um, unless you're asking a question during the question period or in the breakout rooms. Um, during the session, if there is background noise, if you're not on mute, um, I will go through and mute folks um, <laughs> if you're not speaking. And it's not uh, not because we don't want you to talk and participate, but just to keep that audio really clear if you're not the one speaking. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have interpretation. So if you would like to listen in French, you can use the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and my colleague has put the instructions in the chat for that as well. One other thing that I'm going to ask folks to do is to actually um, change your name or add to your name on Zoom here to indicate either EN for English or FR for French. Um, we are going to go into breakout rooms in a little bit, and I want to make sure that we have um, a room where folks can speak in French, a room where folks can speak in English, and that everyone's in their sort of preferred um, language environment. So if you could just um, click on the three dots at the top of your little Zoom square, uh, and you can click rename and just add EN or FR for English or French. You can also change your name from the participants box. Um, you just hover over your name, click more, and then rename yourself. All right. Um, so as you can probably tell, um, today's workshop is going to be interactive. Um, we're going to start with a presentation from Chris Mackey, who is the Director of Research and Policy at Women's Shelters Canada, and Benjamin Roebuck, the Professor of Victimology at Algonquin College and the Research Chair with the Victimology Research Centre there. Um, so they're going to do a presentation and then there'll be a chance for some Q&A if you have questions. And then we'll go into breakout rooms um, and you'll have a chance to kind of discuss with other folks, um, reflect on, you know, resilience that you've seen in your clients, in yourself, um, and, and just have a bit of a discussion. And then we'll come back together for a closing. Um, so before we jump into things, before I pass it over to, to Chris and Ben, we have a little poll, um, which I'm going to launch right now. And this is just, you can take a couple seconds to respond and submit. Uh, this is just for us to get a better sense of who's here with us. So we're asking you to let us know where you're located, um, as well as, you know, have you ever heard of the concept of vicarious resilience? Is this something you're familiar with, something you've never heard of, um, something you're really, really familiar with already? So that'll just give us a sense of where we're at. So I see folks answering. I'm going to leave it up there for another 10 or 20 seconds. All right, so it looks like most folks have had the chance to participate, so I will share those results. So we have um, quite a few folks from BC, from Alberta, Ontario, um, as well as 
Manitoba, from the Atlantic region, the territories, so really spread out. That's wonderful to have folks here from all across the country. Um, and a, a mix here in terms of familiarity with vicarious resilience. So about 20% of folks who haven't heard of it aren't familiar, about 50% that are somewhat familiar, um, and some folks who are very familiar. So I think that's a really interesting mix for, for our conversation today. So. On that note, I'm going to pass it over to Ben and Chris um, to really get into it and tell us a little bit more about vicarious resilience. Thank you for the introduction and, and giving us some context of this work, Leah. Um, I'm Chris. I'm from Women's Shelters Canada, and um, I come to this work as a researcher in the violence against women, anti-violence sector. Um, also, as someone who sat on um, women's shelters boards and as a survivor as well. So. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you about this research and give you guys some space and an opportunity to talk about this topic because I think it's really timely and I think we really need this right now in our sector. Um, I know working in our sector, not frontline like some of you today, but just being exposed to the work and supporting shelters in the work we do at Women's Shelters Canada, that you know our sector has been under some tremendous stress in the past couple of years and a lot of strain and we're seeing a lot of uh, retention issues and high turnover and burnout, vicarious trauma, uh, compassion fatigue. We're seeing a lot of, of, of issues in our sector with the workforce. And we know it's been hard and we know it's been difficult to connect as well during this time while we're all very isolated and working in our own communities or virtually on Zoom as we are today. So really what Ben and I wanted to do today is to provide you all with an opportunity to really reflect on our strengths as a sector and in the work that we do and, and the strength you gain from that work you do with survivors of intimate partner violence and gender-based violence, because we know that we're here because we, we care about folks and we want to end gender-based violence, but also we, we do get something from our work and that's why we continue to do it. And we, we gain a lot of strength from the work we do as well. So we wanted to kind of shift the conversation a little bit today. Um, to get us to think a little bit more about like we know there's a lot of challenges in our sector right now but we want that that chance for to create some space to talk about what is vicarious resilience and what does that look for you in your work and and how how can we carry that forward and and focus on the positive aspects of our work during this difficult time and really connect across across the country get some insights from all of you in your small groups you'll have so we're we're very excited about that um and to kick things off, we wanted to show you a quick video uh, that Ben is going to get ready for us. Uh, Women's Shelters Canada has partnered with um, the Victimology Research Centre on, on several aspects of this work uh, around vicarious resilience. And so for the victimology, uh, the victim, sorry, the victim and survivors of, of crime week, I feel like I'm saying that wrong. But anyway, we helped uh, collaborate on this video that we're going to show you to kind of introduce the concept and give you a sense of what we mean when we're talking about vicarious resilience. Sitting with someone who is grieving can be painful. Repeated exposure to trauma can build over time and leave us feeling burned out. But it can also build resilience. New research is exploring how repeated exposure to other people's strengths, perseverance, and determination can help us grow. We might develop new perspectives, grow in hope, resourcefulness, self-awareness, the ability to be present, or better understand power dynamics and spirituality. Vicarious resilience happens when we reflect on the strengths of the people we help, take care of ourselves, and when we have access to effective support. How have you experienced vicarious resilience? Amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Ben. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, just to, to let folks know, we really want you to know this workshop is for you and we're going to create a lot of time for you to have conversations in your small groups and um, I hope that video helped give a little bit of insight into what the concepts are we're using today and I'll pass it over to Ben to dig a little deeper into that and, and talk through those concepts we're using today 
because we know some folks uh, on the call are not familiar with vicarious resilience. So we want to make sure everyone uh, has a good understanding of it before we break off. Thank you, Chris. I could listen to Chris all day. If you want to give them a little wink or nod, great, great kickoff for the session today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of the concepts of vicarious resilience. We're thrilled to be in partnership with Women's Shelters Canada and about 25 organizations across the country that are looking at the health and well being of service workers who support victims and survivors of crime uh, in different capacities. So, Many of us to be familiar with the idea or the reality of vicarious trauma. We know that when you're working with people and you're sitting with people in their suffering and in their pain and in the challenges and obstacles, that that can have an impact. Um, and for a long time, I think some of the um, emphasis on the well being of workers in this type of work has been on vicarious trauma and self care as a mitigating or way to offset the, the potential harm. And so we know that there can be negative impact from this work and that it can affect your psychological well being your personal sense of safety and self efficacy. What is also true, and I think probably many people in this room can identify our little zoom virtual room uh, is that we gain value from doing this work and from from working with people uh, the honor of being in a, a creating a safe space to listen deeply to someone who needs listening and so more recently there's research that's exploring what some of these positive benefits are that people get from the work and what role that can play in their well-being and sustaining the longevity of their ability to work in the field and so vicarious resilience looks at the positive impact of repeated exposure to witnessing positive coping skills, problem solving and courage uh, to help build your own personal capacity as a helper and to respond to adversity in your own life. Uh, and so uh, you would have seen in the video a few a few highlights around resourcefulness, attentiveness and self efficacy. And so there's seven domains that are measured through a scale that looks at vicarious resilience. Um, one is consciousness about power and privilege relative to your social location. So we find that in this work, a lot of workers do develop that greater self awareness of um, how they walk through life and some of the differences and privilege or obstacles and oppressions that they experience. Um, many people report a stronger capacity to stay present when you're listening to someone's uh, experiences. Um, to recognize for some people the power of spirituality as a resource for survivors to draw on changes in life goals and perspectives for yourself. Uh, client inspired hope increased self awareness and self care practice and increased resourcefulness. I want to highlight just a few things here. So overall, we're looking at vicarious resilience as a concept that's measuring some of the positive impact of the work. It's a bit of a counterbalance to uh, the study of vicarious trauma. Really, it's part of telling the truth of the work that happens. If we focus only on vicarious trauma and don't look at the benefits that workers can have, then we're only measuring a part of the concept. It's not the whole picture. And so it comes to balance out some of the emphasis that's often put on harms and really kind of assess uh, the value that can be sustaining and be a protective factor. One of the nice parts about studying this is that it's naturally occurring. So whether or not you know, it's like that sneaky child who has a paintbrush, you know, and it's going everywhere, whether whether you see them in the moment or not. We've been shut in with kids a lot over the past few years. So it's been a lot of painting on our walls and every possible surface, um, but it's naturally occurring. So this is happening whether you know it or not. And the value of training and really digging into this is that when you can recognize it, when you can look for it, you enhance the value of the process. And so the more reflection that you can invest in how you're growing in your vicarious resilience. Oh, now I've got a little echo here. There we go. Um, then the more uh, value you can draw out of it. And so this is about um, resilience in both your professional and your personal life. And so it all comes together um, holistically. We, I think 
both of us have been reflecting as part of this research process on some of our own personal experiences with vicarious resilience. And we wanted to take a minute to share an example uh, from both of our lives personally that we hope can be a stepping, a stepping stone into our discussion groups that will happen shortly, where we're gonna invite you to consider and reflect on uh, some of your experiences that you've um, noticed and, and uh, uh, benefited from. Chris, do, do you wanna jump in here and go first there? Uh, can you hear me okay? Is it okay? okay. <laughs> All right, just like Leah just waved me down if that happens again. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. I've never had problems with my audio with this computer, so fun times. Uh, yeah, what, what Ben and I, I don't know what Ben shared before I, I got off, but we were uh, wanting to share with you a little bit about our own personal experiences with vicarious resilience because to give you a sense of like how we wrapped our own minds around this concept. And um, I've had the honor and privilege over the past five years of working with survivors and doing research and interviews with them on their experiences within shelters, specifically second stage shelters. Um, and in that work, um, I also interviewed a lot of frontline workers as well. And uh, that time together I've spent with folks in these interviews, creating space for the conversations to really reflect and think about uh, what, what they get from you know, either working or living in these spaces is really profound and it has significantly increased my awareness uh, on how to truly be present and listen to folks when when they're sharing such intimate and deeply personal aspects of their lives. And I know that because I've also had to, been on the receiving end of interviews as a survivor and had to share. So really understanding, truly listening and being present and recognizing it as a and as, as an exchange. It's not one sided. It's an opportunity to talk together and to share our experiences. So for me, um, an example of vicarious resilience I've had is definitely that capacity to hold space and listen and really be present for when people are so vulnerable with their stories. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you, Chris. It's really beautiful. I think for, for myself working as a researcher as well, uh, like Chris has described, I, I really think of conversations like a sacred space uh, and I've been so privileged to be able to learn from people over the years in ways that I've been able to bring into my personal life and in ways that has built my own personal resilience. So an example that comes to mind when I think about this concept was a conversation with um, a, a mother whose child had been murdered and we it's a, a colleague who I worked with quite closely for a number of years and she talked about how um, she had this rage and anger inside of her. And as a woman of faith who had participated in a number of different faith communities, she found that in many of these communities, she was being advised to forgive the offender and to release herself from that anger. And she was in a situation, it was quite a high profile case, the offender was still uh, harassing the family from prison, sending letters, abusing the parole process just to cause pain for the family and being very intentional about that. And so she said to me that she came to the place where she personally knows that God must know that it's too big a thing for her to forgive. And so instead, she gives God her unforgiveness. I sat with that, it really like sank in and I thought, what a radical acceptance and honesty with the current condition, right? And life is messy and there's pain and it's okay to be in those places of pain. Um, for me personally, many years later, uh, I have a family member who is a federally sentenced offender. And when that situation began to unfold, I reflected on hearing from this woman and thinking for myself personally and in my own reflections, my own faith journey with spirituality, just to have this radical acceptance of where things are in a way that I don't have to strive to get the right thoughts. I don't have to work to have the right feelings. I can just be me, be honest and sit with it uh, and, and be okay. And um, it was one of many 
treasures that I've that I've taken into my life personally from that great privilege of being able to listen. And I'm confident that across our little Zoom room that you can think of some of those times too, which is where we're going to go in our discussion. Um, but before we get there, I want to um, pass this back to Chris to talk a little bit. Oh no, I'm going to start us and then I'll pass it to Chris. Um, this, this work that we're presenting today comes from a national study on vicarious resilience and victim service providers. And we're looking at all different types of victim services uh, and workers who are supporting survivors of violence. And we've heard from more than 650 people across the country in every province and territory in this study. And then we have subgroups that are looking at different sectors. So, so far, the survey is still open and we'll tell you later how you can participate if you haven't yet. Um, oh, there. Beautiful. It's like magic. Uh, and if, if, if you can't remember that link later, it's really nice and easy. It's vicariousresilience.ca or uh, resiliencevicariante.ca. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to share uh, or start the ball rolling on sharing what we've heard so far from workers in um, domestic violence shelters. I'll share the screen here again. So, so far, we have 70 participants who are working in the shelter system. Tell your friends, they can all participate. And um, this is coming from the survey data. We're also conducting interviews with a $20 e-gift card of your choice. So you've been told, I'll, I'll tell you how to do that too. Um, but this is, this is what we're hearing. So uh, of, this, of these 70 people, um, you can see on our little map of Canada, roughly where we're hearing the most from. So BC has been our strongest contributor so far in this in the survey. About 7% are working primarily in remote or northern areas, 21% in urban areas, 31 in rural, and 40% in a mix of urban and rural settings. And I'm going to pass it over to Chris to talk about some of the organizational sector components of this study. Right. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited to present this data to you today. And uh, I know we are eager to get into our breakout groups as well. So I, I'm just checking with Leah on our time. I'll try to get through these uh, slides a little bit quicker, but um, I'm sure we'll be able to provide these after, after our presentation for you to, to look at. Um, but we did want to just show you um, some of the responses. And uh, this is kind of at the organizational level of of, of where folks are at. And so some of the stats that really, you know, stuck out to me were that, you know, 46% of people are, of, of workers are working over time, 40% are working an extra job to supplement their income, uh, you know, 51% are making less than $50,000 a year. So we're really looking at the, the, the context of like the, the, the working conditions and, and how um, wages are supplemented. And as you can see from some of the stats, stats on the last row there is that we do have, you know, about 35%, a third of workers leaving because of workplace stress. And so part of what we're interested in knowing here and, and looking at these numbers is just like, you know, we know there's problems, we know there's challenges here. And, and a lot of these are related to um, some of the funding issues in our sector in terms of how that's allocated. And that's why organizations struggle to, um, provide for adequate wages and supplements for, for their workers. Um, so we know it's a, a much bigger topic and issue that we can definitely dive into another time. Um, can we switch the slide, Ben, is that okay? And so on top of gathering data and the numbers, we also provided opportunities for people to share their own thoughts and uh, reflections in comment boxes throughout the survey. And some of these, I won't read them all to you, but really you can, you can hear in these quotes that folks are feeling not fairly compensated, um, they're feeling undermined in this as a, in the because of the lack of funding from the governments, um, and they feel underappreciated by funders and and other servicing organizations, and and really you know I, I appreciate the quote the third quote down um, and I'll read it aloud to folks who maybe can't see it on their screen, and the the respondent says I'm deeply concerned for my staff too. The staff turnover has been very high. 
and some are reporting nightmares, sleeplessness, feelings of hopelessness, because we are so busy and still not able to help everyone in need. And we've heard this time and time again in our sector of just that there's just so much work to always be done and there's never enough time, never enough folks to, to help do that work. So on the flip side though, too, we didn't want to just present all doom and gloom because we know this is complex and the work that we do is very, it's, it's not just all negative. And we know that you know, organizations and shelters are doing their very best to uh, compensate in other ways. There's a lot of non-financial ways that shelters support their staff and, and work towards health, healthy, uh, health and wellness in the workplace. So, and some of that includes, as you see in that last quote, just like non-hierarchical decision-making and you know, adhering to feminist anti-oppressive practices in the workplace. So we do have a lot of strengths and a lot of beautiful qualities in our sector, despite the fact that we're chronically underfunded and constantly trying to, to uh, compensate for that. Um, so really trying to just give you a quick little snapshot of some of the things we've heard. I'll pass it over to uh, Ben to talk a bit more about some of the other data. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate this um, content on the organizational structures, because what I didn't talk about earlier is how resilience isn't just a personal process. It's an interaction with the resources that are available around us. And so we're trying to learn more in this study about how organizations, how the existing work uh, uh, structures affect the well-being and the resilience of workers. So here's um, maybe some peppier stats that look a lot happier. So thank you, Chris, for, for sharing the earlier bit. I get to come in and be like, ah, oh, look at this. Um, when we were looking at a number of indicators, there was quite high satisfaction from workers in the shelter uh, sector. So 75%, 74, 72% uh, said that they were satisfied or very satisfied with their relationship with their coworkers, with the support they get with the, from their supervisors, and with their participation in decision making. And that participation really does speak, like Chris was saying, to uh, the non-hierarchical approaches to decision making that make people feel included and sometimes sustain people in those relationships and conditions regardless of the benefits of the compensation. Um, when it comes to the vicarious resilience scale, here we see very strong affirmation of a number of the indicators of vicarious resilience. So 100% of people said that they were more aware of how privilege and marginalization affect access to resources, both for people that they're helping and for themselves. Um, and then we had a really high validation of workers saying that they feel more resourceful, more present, more hopeful about people's capacity to heal from trauma, feeling more compassionate, and more connected to people in their own lives. And so these are really great benefits that help to round out the story of what's happening in the field. And so we want to provide a few quotes from uh, participants uh, in this area as well. And I do want to be very pointed and intentional about validating both the adversity and the difficulty as well as some of the benefit. And so without reading through this uh, quote, it talks about some of the harms of the work. It talks about um, feeling like all of the helping capacity that this person has is used up at work and they don't have a lot left to give to other people in their life. They're more frustrated with the political systems, um, feeling uh, more burnt out, that their own mental health and work satisfaction is slipping a bit. Um, but at the same time here at the end saying, despite all of this, I actually also feel more empathetic, more grateful and more forgiving. And those are really beautiful values. And then we saw so much feedback about some of these positive benefits. So uh, people talked about learning to be gentle with themselves, um, being in awe of other people's resilience in a way that makes them feel less judgmental and more aware of their privilege, uh, being more patient, having a desire to promote hope, learning that you're not the expert, but you can help somebody else with their own expertise in their life. And really, um, 
in a in a culture that's so polarizing at the moment learning that things are, are not black and white so learning about the complexity and the nuance in life um here's a beautiful quote in french about maturity and leadership autonomy um, knowledge self-confidence and resilience and then this is what I really wanted to point out because I think it's valuable on one of the earlier slides that Chris had shown 46% of workers in the study identified that they came to the work because of a personal experience of victimization uh, or a personal experience of violence. And so this says it's helping me. I'm so shocked that as a helper with lived experience, I'm not triggered as much as I used to be or figured I ought to be. Right. And, and I think for what we hear clearly in the data is for survivors engaged in this work, there's some really deep personal value and meaning in engaging in this and from victimization generally often one of the things that's really protective and really helpful is finding meaning, whether it's in work or somewhere else, being able to attribute meaning to experiences that you've had in your life. And then finally, being more capable and compassionate because uh, I've built self-efficacy. So this is part of the story. This is part of what's happening in shelters and COVID-19. As much as there's burnout and issues with turnover, uh, workers are also drawing on these resources. And knowing that resilience is not just an individual process, we hope that our research can call attention to some of the bigger structural issues that are also affecting the well-being of workers so that we can really dig into building healthy and collective systems that support the resilience and the growth of people who are doing such important work. And I'll stop the screen share here. Uh, Leah, I know you're ready to send us off. Um, should I should I note the our study stuff now, or do you want me to save that? To Go for it. Yeah. Go for okay. it. Okay. Thank you, um, and thank you, Ben, for providing that rounded. I I did feel it feel like the Debbie Downer, like, and here's all the terrible things. So I was like, thank you, Ben, because that is what has been so motivating as a researcher who's had to like document the increase of IPV across Canada over the pandemic, and just I'm embedded in this you know, the, the really horrifying data every day. This work has been very inspiring and very motivating for me. And uh, like coinciding with this, you know, we are, Women's Shelters Canada is launching a national study on feminist brain drain. So looking at the retention challenges in the domestic violence shelters across the country. And so a big part of that work is drawing on this survey. So we're encouraging folks and managers who are here today and frontline workers really share that in your organizations because this data, which is just shared in the chat there, is going to really create some good foundational uh, um, data for us for pushing our study forward, which will include, you know, national focus groups and a symposium where we bring folks together to really tap into this strength side that Ben's been talking about. Like, what do, what are the solutions? How do we retain our workers? How do we attract new talent? How do we save all this great expertise, all this feminist expertise we have around in, in, our, in our organizations and how to really um, harness that and keep it because we don't want to lose anyone, right? Like we want to have a healthy sector. So um, we really encourage uh, folks to um, share this survey with their staff. And it's really an opportunity to reflect on workplace wellness and have that conversation. This is about connecting. This is about breaking the silence around these challenges, right? We need to be open and connect on these things so that we can come up with the solutions. And so I will finally stop talking, Leah, and uh, let you take over. <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening. No, thank you, Chris and Ben. That was an amazing presentation. Really, really interesting. Um, and I think there's a lot there for, for everyone to think about and, and discuss in the breakout rooms. Uh